what in the world is going on in our culture? What is happening? And what is our responsibility as Christians to engage culture? We're going to be looking at these questions today on the Truth in Love Show. What does the Bible say about speaking the truth in love? Welcome to the Truth in Love show. I am incredibly excited about today's episode, and I am joined with Dennis Lewis. Thank you so much for uh, being on the show again with us. It's fantastic to be here. Very excited about this episode. So as we look into culture and the problems that we're facing, it can get a little overwhelming, and I think sometimes Christians have this attitude that if they lock themselves in their basement and only watch Fox News, that somehow <laughs> the world will be a better place. And God's yeah. not calling us to do that, is he? No, he's not. And and that's really the two choices that we're faced with. Either we're going to lock ourselves in a commune or we're going to get out there and actually engage culture. So that's what we need to do. I think you found a clip for us to, oh. to look look at. Yeah, Tell it's a wonderful that. clip by uh, Mike Metzger, and it's really talking about how should Christians engage culture. Let's take a look. Yep. There's nothing new in history. I mean, the best historical precedent for the world we live in today happened 2,500 years ago, and it was called the Babylonian exile. And the Jews had so squandered and well, hadn't done particularly well in their faith for hundreds of years, and God took them and plunked them in Babylon and said, we're going to start over. And the first two things they did, uh, studied the language and literature of Babylon. And then the second thing was uh, they began to seek the flourishing of Babylon so that uh, Nebuchadnezzar would take their faith seriously. The reason I say this is very similar to the world we're in today is the city of Babylon, which had the eighth wonder of the world, the um, Hanging Gardens, had 1,197 temples. There was religion everywhere, and it was all the same. And God said, good, now I'm going to put you in this situation. Now, here's the trick. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't take any of these faiths seriously. That's why he has diviners in his court. Your challenge is to learn the language and literature of these people, figure out ways for them to flourish. And as you do that, and as they flourish, so shall you flourish. And as they take the, your faith seriously, they'll see there is one true God. I happen to think we're back in that age today. Uh, I think that the modern age most closely parallels the Babylonian exile, and that our best move is to learn the language and literature of what the world we're living in, what it's saying, seek its flourishing, find ways for it to do well and do good, and have those people, many of them leaders, come back and say, where the heck do you get this stuff? Well, wow, why is this so helpful? And. Um, it's a big, big challenge. There's a lot to take away from that clip from Metzger. I really like how thoughtful he was. Right. I liked uh, his, his pacing and his thinking, but I've got to say this before we jump into this because I think there's a lot to take away. All right, all right. I do it. think that the Daniel exile right. metaphor right. is a little stretch considering the fact that Christians in the United States are not slaves. Right. Um, Christians in the United States have the opportunity to vote in their government. Right. And we haven't been removed from our land. Right. And I think, I think it's good to be reminded of that because right. I think some Christians don't ever participate in government because they're living in exile. But when we were talking about this early, as you mentioned, Daniel very much was active even right. when he didn't have right. that standing. And so we as Christians should have a even greater influence. So yeah. you had some ideas for us about that. Yeah, so I, like you, I found the metaphor problematic. If we were to MacGyver <laughs> what he was saying into something that you and I would agree with, we would use the terminology of pilgrims. 
right? Pilgrims in a foreign land. This world is not our home, yet we participate in this world. And as you rightly um, pointed out, we have certain freedoms. So in light of that, how do we as Christians engage the culture with all of these things in mind? And I think the Apostle Paul in Acts 17 gives us three specific things that we can look at, and then we can dialogue about that a little bit. First of all, is Paul evidenced a true love and desire for God that allowed him to love the people around him well? Second of all, the Apostle Paul not only had this love for people, but he found common ground, something that they can all agree on. And then the third thing that we see coming out of that is that the Apostle Paul provided what was missing. Because if you're talking to unbelievers, there's something missing. And all of those are represented in the Mars Hill narrative. And I think that's a good rubric by which we can go and engage our culture. Give those three again. So number one, a love for God, evidenced by a love for others. The second one, very succinctly, is that he found common ground. And then the third one is he provided what was missing. Love, common ground, and a solution. Yes. Oftentimes I find when I'm talking with skeptics that there's been a shift Mm -hmm. where sometimes in the past I would say they want to know what is true. Right. Where now, even if it's true, it doesn't matter. I want to know how it affects me. And the gospel is a solution to a problem. I'd like to add to that. I think it's valuable to praise the truth wherever you find Mm. it. So when someone is speaking truth, even if I disagree with 95% of the things they say, I like to go to the 5% we agree on. And that's kind of that finding common ground. And one of the ways I can find common ground is I was like, you know what you said there? That was true. Yeah. And we could start there and work out and go, but I disagree with with this or that. And that's where we show that that compassion and that love that we have for the individual. Um, Now, we are looking. What is our next clip here, Dennis? Well, our next clip, we're going to look at two separate clips that shows the wrong way (laughs) to do this. And then we're going to see another clip that shows the right way to do it. Let's let's look at the wrong way here. All right. You say God is basically cause of everything, right? So basically, he does God it. He doesn't cause let it. Let me finish. He does it. Let me finish. Don't interrupt me. Well, ba- say it right, me, then. Okay, let me finish. Now, basically, God, because I'm gay, right? What? He's the reason because I'm gay, right? Why do I need to know that? I made the choice to be gay. Why do so, I need to know that? Okay, okay. So why how are you gonna call everybody else rebels? How are you gonna say that uh, everybody gotta repent nationally? And your what if I don't want to repent to nationally? Hell. How you know what I'm not doing in my own household? You just told me. Okay, I'm just saying. You I'm not just speaking just for me. I'm told speaking me. for everybody I didn't else. How know. you gonna say? Right, you know, TMI. Okay. Okay, drop that question. I didn't anyway, want to know that, about that. Question. that. Stop. Let me finish my other question. All right. You just were God, dying Jesus to tell died me. For everybody sins, you stood right? in that Why long line just so you could tell everyone that you're a dyke. There's people out here getting raped. People out here shooting and killing. How proud your mama must be. I'm proud to be gay. I don't give a I fuck. Exactly. So okay. I don't care. Like I was saying. That's Jesus why you had to come up there and tell. You declare your sin is Sodom. Jesus me. died for everybody's sins. So no. why? Uh, he didn't? No. He, so he wasn't on that cross dying for everybody's he sins? He didn't really? die for everybody's okay. sins. Right. He died for whatever. all the whatever. sins of his care. elect. Okay. Whatever. Why is your main focus on homosexuality? When why it's is ho- yours? Can you let me finish? Damn. Anyway, why is your main focus on homosexuality when there's people out here getting raped, killed, shooting, doing drugs and all that stuff, but your main focus is on me and my people? Uh, Why? Your people? My homosexuality people. Why? Uh, Your sin is the sin, your proud sin. Do you have, have you seen a rapist pride parade? I don't know. No, but you've seen a fag pride parade. Yeah, gay. They're not gay. Do you know they commit suicide? Lots of them. Because of people they like have you. A because of people lifespan. like you. They're not gay. But I'm not about to kill myself because I don't care what the fuck you got to say to me. Perfectly good words all. to fit your agenda doesn't this make it so. A fag pride parade is the reason. Whew, that was a concerning video. If you're not bothered by that, you should be. Uh, We're going to take a break, but when we come back, we're going to look at what the Bible says about how to engage. We're going to break this video down and then show you a video from Tim Keller about how to do it right when we come back. Want more information about speaking the truth in love? 
text the word PREPARED to 345345. We will send you a free resource that will equip you to speak the truth in love. Also consider our Truth in Love digital resource for your church, small group, or family. Learn from six lessons that include videos from panel experts and teaching from Ben Shetler, all shot on location in New York City. Download it today at the Center for Truth and Love .org. Welcome back to the Truth in Love show, the place where we are teaching you what the Bible says and how to speak that truth to our culture. Now, Dennis, we just looked at how not to do it, and probably <laughs> she nailed every wrong thing that you could do. Let's let's break this clip down a little bit. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate. So first of all, showing a, a genuine love for the person that you're talking about. Now, of the three that we've discussed, showing a genuine love for others, um, you know, the second one, finding common ground, and then the third one, you know, providing what's missing. Two and three is a learned skill. The first one depends upon the work of the Holy Spirit on, in your heart. And that's why it's so important mm -hmm. for a Christian to evidence that because that's a, that's, that shows that the Holy Spirit is working in your heart and that you truly love God because you're evidencing a love for someone else. When we truly experience the gospel, right. what it means to have been redeemed, right. then we can love others. And it mm -hmm. doesn't, we love him because he first loved oh, us. Yeah. And then we love others because it's him loving through us. Right. I really Absolutely. believe that. Yeah. So that is missed. And right. you, you don't sense that. Not at I, all. I also would say developing love, I believe, is a work of the Holy Spirit. But I also think we need to remember uh, to, to, to kind of think through what other people are going, right. going through. And I mean, Paul says, as such were some of you. I mean, is there ever a time where we have to think back to, man, I used to think like that. Yeah. I used to, uh, you know, I was deceived at one time. And so I, I need to be compassionate to maybe someone else who's deceived. Yeah, there's an aspect of that that's truly cognitive. You have to be aware of the fact that, hey, I have to consciously think about putting myself in this other person's shoe and the like. However, there's some of that is Holy Spirit driven, obviously. Yeah. And so my only concern in this clip as we see that, she showed no love for the young lady that was there. And secondly, in my opinion, um, that hindered her from finding common ground. Now, let's be fair to her. She did present the gospel, but hey, we're in a show that's encouraging people to speak the truth in love. And in my opinion, she failed ultimately in that. Yeah, and, and I think in a pretty big way. But we've got a clip of someone who's doing it right yeah. at Google. Oh, yeah. Uh, Tim Keller, honestly, a lot of good things yeah. in his writing. I enjoy it. But listen to how Tim Keller engages some of these skeptics. Hi. And could it be that the derivation of basic human rights comes from our ability to see perspective and take the role of another person? And maybe that is just a good evolutionary strategy? The, right. Then the, what you're saying is then human rights just helps you pass your genetic code on. It's basically a form of selfishness. In other words, you're saying that, that the, the trouble with saying that everything comes from evolution, uh, that my uh, that this, the, the feeling that it's wrong to exploit somebody basically helps me pass my genetic material on. Uh, if that's all you want to say human rights is, I would say, then why can't I get away with it? In other words, I guess I would say, that doesn't tell me that human rights are really there. What that tells me is why I feel that they're there. That, see, I think Dershowitz, see, Dershowitz actually deals with that a little bit. He says, if you say the reason so many of us, and most people don't believe in human rights, okay, but the reason so many of us here believe in human rights is because it was the, it's our next stage of evolution, and we feel that they're there. But you, that only tells me why I feel they're there, not that they are there. So I wouldn't say your argument goes far enough. Okay, thanks. I think I did a lot better with him than you, so. <laughs> you, you have a very good point, anyway. It's a, it's a, I understand what you're saying, and I hope I... I'm not making short shrift of these big deals, but uh, I don't have too much time. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Keller, first I wanted to thank you for joining us today. Um, one of the many interesting Who's that? points. Oh, this is Cornelius. Cornelius. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, one of the many interesting points you made had to do with the uh, increasing prevalence of Orthodox religions in our society. 
And I was wondering, I read an uh, essay by an economist named Lawrence Anacone. He yeah. talks about why strict churches are strong. You know, basically that he oh. feels a, the social advantages of a strict church become increasingly you know, desirable as uh, society becomes more wealthy and educated. I was wondering if you had any comments on it. That sounds a little bit like, uh, I, no, I, I don't know. I haven't read that. It sounds a little bit like a, a sociologist named Dean Kelly back in the early 70s wrote a book called Why Conservative Churches Are Growing and said the same thing. And I, you know, as a, as a Christian believer, I would say that can only be partly right. But I, I, could, I could see that to some degree, uh, you'll find uh, those kinds of churches are att pretty attractive when the society is very mobile and there's like no community. And it kind of creates, it's an automatic community in a place where no one knows anyone. But the fact is that Christianity grows all over the place. I mean, uh, the, uh, you know, Christianity grew uh, explosively in China, in the rural areas in the last 50 years, where there was no mobility, there was tremendous community, and yet it's the same kind of crunchy, robust, orthodox, conservative religion that's grown there as is growing in our exurbs right now. So when, if somebody wants to say one of the reasons why people go to those churches is it creates community as the world's becoming, as their society's becoming more, uh, there's, there's more detachment and people feel there's no community. I agree, but that you can't reduce the growth of Christianity to that. That's all. And thank you for bringing Cornelius up. You're welcome. He's sweetheart. Hi. I have a comment and a question. Um, sure. My comment is I think you've misunderstood the anthropic principle, um, which characterizes there's a multitude of universes and we just happen to be in one with fine tuned uh -huh. constants. Okay. The problem is that the fine tuned constants are required for our existence. And the poker game analogy falls down because 20 hands of four aces in a row are not a requirement to have an observer there to witness the cards being dealt. An equivalent to the poker game analogy would be to say, well, we discovered this nebula in a distant galaxy that happens to make the exact shape of the Ten Commandments written in ancient Hebrew. If you showed me such a, a nebula, I would be immediately convinced that Christianity, or Judaism at least, was true. Um, but the existence of that nebula does not predicate my existence, and that's why that would convince me. So. Yeah, if every, listen, I, I'm not completely convinced by what you just said, and I think some of it's subjective. If every, if, if most, they heard what I said and what you said. Mm -hmm. We probably ought to leave it at that. I mean, I, sure. it, was, it was, I thought, I mean, I read Dawkins pretty closely. Mm -hmm. And I thought Dawkins said that we would be in the only universe that actually is the right universe for our Right, because we can't exist in the other universe. But he's still saying, right, but he's still saying that, yes, I see what you mean, that we just happen to be in this universe. And it would well, have to be. Well, it's not so much that we happen to be. It's that the universe that allows for observers has observers. And so, well, you would say it just happens that there's one universe that grows human life, though. You would agree with that. That's true. Well, that's, that's the point of the poker game. Uh, it still think it's different, but I'll move on to my question, because um, we could argue about this for an hour. OK. Um, my question is, if God is the only basis for human rights, then why is it that, uh, at least in many parts of the world, we've seen a trend toward increasing secularism and increasing human rights at the same time? Well, there's both a, uh, read Nicholas Wolderstorff's new book, Justice, Rights, and Wrongs. It's brand new. It's a hard book. It's, he's, a, he's a philosopher from Yale. It's Princeton University Press. And he says that there is both an enlightenment basis for human rights and a Christian one. Okay. And he would say one of the reasons why the enlightenment view of human rights is individu the individual is, is the main unit. Individual rights, indiv the individual happiness is more important than the community. Mm -hmm. Whereas the classic, most cultures, it's the community is more important than the individual. Uh, Christ uh, the idea of human rights, according to uh, Wolderstorff, grew out of Christian roots, but it also can grow out of enlightenment roots. But it's pretty tough to see it growing out of some other religions. Okay. So it's in there. It's, it but if it grows out of enlightenment roots, then as we well don't as need, yes, as well as Christian. But if, if if both lead to human rights, then we don't need Christianity or oh no. I, listen, I would never wait. Rights. Oh wait, I'm glad you said this because I want to make this clear. I am not saying you got to believe in God to be moral, okay, or yeah, to have human rights. I would say it's a bigger leap. All I'm trying to say is it makes more sense of the thing you believe in, which is human rights, mm -hmm. that there be a God than not. That's all I'm trying to say. 
So that then you, you're sort of confronting, I'm kind of trying to confront you to say, well then, what's the big problem with God if so many of the things you believe in fit in with real belief in God? That's all. But you're absolutely right. I certainly don't want anybody to think you've got to believe in God in order to be a champion of human rights. And actually, history will show you that it was basically Christians and deists, agnostics, that together came up with the idea of the United States Constitution in which church and state was separate and a big emphasis on individual rights. It was a, it was a confluence of those two groups. So we were able to get together and agree that we wanted America the way it is. Great questions. I hope I did them justice. Yes. Now, the clip you just saw, as I mentioned, is from Tim Keller. He's a best-selling author. He's actually a pastor that lives in New York City, and he's actually transitioned out of his church. Yeah. He now is yeah. leading a massive church planting movement. I think that I think Redeemer City to City has already planted like 500 churches wow. in cities around the world. It's, it's pretty incredible. But um, I, I'm going to tell you a story about Tim sure, Keller yeah, that, I, that I think is powerful. Um, when it comes to this engagement, you see how he got it right. Yeah. But not only that, when you get it right, teaching other people how to get it right. So I was in Madison Square Park on two separate occasions where I encountered people that I was just blown away, like asking skeptics, engaging right. people. And I was just blown away with their ability to articulate the gospel, not just like, hey, I'm a believer, but their ability to, to engage on an intellectual level and right. speak the truth in love. And, um, well, I, I asked them, I was like, well, I got to know, where'd you go to church? And in both cases, they're like, oh, we go to Tim Keller's church, Redeemer, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. Redeemer Presbyterian. And uh, so I think that there's a lot to learn yeah. from Tim Keller. But, but Dennis, give me some of your thoughts. What, what are some things he got right there? Well, first of all, clearly he evidenced a love for the other person. He was humble. You know, he admitted in some other clips, he admitted when he didn't fully explain something well. He showed a, a care for one of the questioners, uh, baby, and, and it was genuine, you can yeah. tell. Next, Tim is very good at finding common ground. I think that's important. He did that very well. And the last is that he spoke the truth in love. He, he addressed their concern, he tried to be as specific as he could, and he understood the limitations in which he himself brought to the table. Ben, I agree with you. I've met Tim personally. I don't want to exalt him as being the top person in all of this. But his pastor's heart, his love for others, and his passion toward the truth came out in a way that is instructive for us, but people would do well to model their engagement with our culture after that, because I think it was very effective. Yeah, I, I never forget the first time that I encountered one. It was this, this young lady, um, and I was interviewing her. And I was asking questions that the conclude, like, like I was setting her up as yeah. it were. And I'll never forget how skilled she answered those questions. Right. And then I was, I was like, well, what do you do? Because I expect her to be like, I teach apologetics at a college. Wow. And she's like, I work in retail. And I think that's a good lesson for yeah. all of us because we can't be effective. We can't, it doesn't, you don't have to be Tim Keller. Yeah. Um, all of us can speak the truth in a loving way. And I think yeah. that's important for us to remember. Absolutely. So as we conclude this episode, I always hate the end of the show because <laughs> there's so much that w all of us need to learn with regard to speaking the truth in love. So I hope you'll join us in our next episode. But as we conclude, I think it's important for us to be reminded of the love of Christ because that's where yeah. this begins. God was our creator, is our creator, and we broke his one rule in the garden, and we've been breaking his rules ever since, and God loved us anyways, and he stepped into our story as Jesus died on a cross and then rose again, offering salvation and redemption to all those that believe in him, and it's our prayer that you would trust Jesus Christ personally as your savior. And if you have, that you tell other people about Jesus. Dennis, very much looking forward to our next episode. Absolutely, looking forward to his as well. And I'm looking forward to continuing to teach people how to speak the truth in love. Join us next time on Truth and Love.
For more truth about current topics, follow Ben Shetler on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Visit the Center for Truth and Love.org where you can download resources to equip your family, learn through our curious conversation videos, or even book Ben Shetler to speak at your church or upcoming event. Our ministry is supported by the generous giving of people like you. Please consider giving a monthly or one time tax deductible gift at the Center for Truth and Love.org forward slash give. One more thought about truth and love. Uh, a while back, I was in Times Square just a few days before the new decade of 2020 was coming in. And I started asking people what would be their guide as they entered a new year in a new decade. You know, beyond just the new year, every day our lives are guided by something. Listen to what they said. Oh, 2020, yo, big year, what big year. Gonna, so we're about to go into a new decade. So a new year, a new decade. In that new year, what is going to guide you? Wow, what a question. Yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> I don't know. But what's going to guide you in the next decade, Tim? Um, I think that what always guided me is like um, treating people how you want it to be treated yourself. What will guide you in the next decade? Sticking with our families, sticking with our values, and uh, yeah, keep doing good. I will say to me, uh, my insights, like my heart, what my belly says to do. That's gonna be my guide. Straight money, man. It's all about to get money, get back. We around. Make sure you throw that on there. Share love is the most important thing. Oh, it's gonna be 420 for an entire month. That's pretty guiding. That's like a goal. I don't know. I kind of live on a whim in general. I don't make a lot of long-term plans, but it's just whatever I think is going to make me happy for the long term. What's going to guide us in 2020? Yeah. Our wisdom, our knowledge that, that we took from 2019, we're going to carry it over to 2020, make it yes, better. Sir. Our slogan in our school at the moment is uh, show who you are. And I think that is what has been going on the last decade, but will be even more in the next decade. You have to find your own strength. You're, you have to uh, be secure with who you are and know your talent. If you know your talent, then you can uh, accept all the things that are demanded from you by the society. Some interesting responses. When you're recording in Times Square, you never know what you're going to get. But let's think about what we heard. We heard someone say that drugs were going to guide them, money would guide them, friends and family or past experiences. But one young lady, the young lady from Venezuela, what she said really, I feel, reflects what's happening in our culture. She said, I'm going to look to my insides. And of course, what she meant was she's going to be guided by her gut, by her heart, by her feelings. The problem with that guide is it changes based on you. Our feelings change all the time. And so if we're going to be guided in a quality way, we need a guide that's outside of ourselves. When we look at the Bible, we find a book that God himself wrote to reveal the world that he made, our purpose in life, and our future destiny. This is why I love the truth on the truth and love show. And I love talking about truth because the Bible, as we enter whatever the next phase is of our life, whether it's a new year, a new decade, or tomorrow, a new day, we need an ultimate guide from God. The Bible is that guide. And I hope that you will read it, live it, and share this important book with everyone you know.